The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Our tree is an infinite provider. The fruit will always be in reach. All our protectors have to do is harvest and eat and share with us. If we're good and not evil by the new definitions, never again will politicians be limited by resources. Because any number of promises can be made. And all promises will be kept because we have access to the infinite. This is the theory of the infinite money tree. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. Yeah, I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. Well, gosh, I can't believe we've already gotten through quarter one, Dave. Uh, but, you know, one of the nice things about a quarter ending is uh, those who want to hear Doug Noland and you talk about what's going on in the markets, they can tune in to the tactical short call because you do that each quarter. Well, and of course, Doug writes the Credit Bubble Bulletin every weekend, and that is a treasure trove for those who are interested in not only the credit markets, but the financial markets in general, getting you uh, very much granular detail on what has happened in the in the preceding week. And that's free to tune in on M Wealth M. Dot com. So if you just go to mwealthm.com, you can tune in. And actually, Doug is somebody that uh, you and I, Dave, have read for decades before he came on on staff. Yeah. So join us for the Thursday Tactical Short Quarterly Call, contemplating an inflection point. It's 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time uh, this Thursday. And as Kevin mentioned, you can register for that at mwealthm.com and submit your questions there as well. One of the things you've brought out over the last few years, Dave, is this incredible technology of blockchain, which, of course, is in the form of Bitcoin, Ethereum, those other currencies. Ken Rogoff, he said what was obvious, and that is it's not the kind of thing that will ensure independence for long. Uh, It's almost like it's been tested in the free market. And now the governments who see the monopoly of their own money creation being threatened, now we're starting to see it take over. It's, It's intriguing to see Bitcoin come under pressure this week. And uh, there's a number of reasons that were given if you read Bloomberg. Yeah, certainly rumors of the Treasury Department pursuing financial institutions for money laundering using cryptocurrencies. We had Bitcoin down 15% over the weekend, not an incidental or small amount, but you also had reports suggesting that it was instead uh, an electricity blackout in Jianjing, a region in China, and that the Bitcoin miners in that space were hit. So cryptocurrency markets uh, then followed suit. Uh, What is not conjecture is the U.S. imposition of sanctions on Russia, including Russian-linked Bitcoin addresses, which we read about at Nasdaq.com. We could skip right past that, but I'm still trying to fathom U.S. targeted sanctions on something that's supposed to be anonymous. Do you see what I'm getting at? Well, yeah, and it just shows me the vulnerabilities right now of cryptocurrency. I mean, you you mentioned money laundering as being one of the possibilities, you know, the the crackdown on that. You mentioned electricity blackouts. You mentioned sanctions on Russia. And then, of course, regulation. That's something that you've brought up in the past as well. Regulation in the various countries is coming. Yeah, certainly when you see legislation coming down the pike, there has to be some sort of a boogeyman. What what exactly are you addressing? What is the threat? What is the problem? What are we trying to keep the people safe from? And that explanation is is sort of the justification of why things need to change. Now, we know that most boogeymen don't actually exist, but it doesn't mean that there aren't rules coming. And, you know, finally, we have the Indian government moving forwards with regulation of cryptocurrency ownership and trading. A Reuters article suggested that even a ban uh, was imminent, and I don't think it's going that far, but I think we would guess that there's both control and compliance um, and and monitoring, which which the Indian government will find sufficient. Is it any wonder that people are trying to find other areas for their cash to go into? Because they're just drunk right now with too much cash, but... uh, Loan loan activity with the banks is going down. I mean, why why would you loan money when the money's free? Yeah, there's a consistent theme between what we see from the J.P. Morgan earnings report and a few other banks, uh, and and also what we hear from friends in the banking business. Loan growth is flat to down. Uh, deposits are moving higher very quickly, and I guess that comes as no surprise. You've got stimulus checks certainly playing a role. 
Of course, for us locally, that means reaching a deposit threshold where no more money will be coming in the door. That isn't banks don't want it. Uh, just think about that. I wonder just if you go to another part of, of the economy I, and, and thinking about money in general, I wonder if velocity picks up when you have excess capital that banks can't or simply refuse to absorb. That's what I wonder. Where does it go? Even before this COVID, you know, all the $1,400 checks and all the money that's been coming, you know, just for free from the government, you've been concerned really since, oh, I don't know, 2011, 2012, of all this liquidity that was created through quantitative easing and, uh, you know, bond buying and, and other manipulations or, or, you know, just little dances that the Fed would do. Uh, this money was being held back, and I love the analogy that you gave. It's like being held back behind Hoover Dam. As long as that dam can keep that money behind it, then we're fine. But what happens when velocity picks up and that dam either breaks or water flows over the top? And this is a really unique period of time because you've got the federal government who is pushing money into the system, and typically you would see it hit the banks, and before it gets spent, sort of sit there as a repository, something that is going to be spent. Uh, the top 25 banks saw loan balances actually drop by 8% in aggregate in the first quarter. Uh, a couple of different measures on that, between 8 and 10% in the first quarter. And this is the lowest loan to deposit ratio in the 36 years that the data has been collected. It's almost like a reverse, it's a wonderful life. Remember in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, everyone's coming to get their deposits out. In this case, you've got a line of people to put their deposits in. That's right. It's, it's the opposite. People want to put money in. Deposits have been on the rise. On average, across all of your major banks, up 15% for J.P. Morgan, the big winner. In the first quarter, deposits rose 24%, wow. up 6% quarter over quarter, 24% year over year. Uh, they had loans declined by 4% and loans declined more broadly, 8 to 10% across the entire industry. So last week had the big banks reporting Q1 earnings. And uh, we also had the announcement of J.P. Morgan issuing $13 billion in bonds. Hmm. Demand flowing to the underwriters was absolutely insane. $13 billion in bonds on offer, $26 billion in bids. That is $26 billion in demands for, for those bonds. But kind of a popular offering. Could that be the new form of banking? I mean, could it be that bonds are replacing uh, loans? Well, that was Thursday. Friday, Bank of America offered $15 billion in bonds. Wow. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, who knows what that suggests in terms of the C-suite and the conversations they're having in a boardroom somewhere. Are they preparing for a shift to higher rates? I mean, whatever the thinking, the bond market is gobbling up debt. And whether it's exchange-traded funds that have got bonds in them or what have you, investment-grade debt, it's, the appetite for it's just been unbelievable. And it may be, as you suggest, it may be that the bond market has largely replaced the commercial bank in our generation and has changed the flow of central bank stimulus. In a different era, monetary policy would have flowed through to the public more directly. Main Street would have seen it. It's not anymore. Loan growth, you've got that shrinking, um, ironically, in an age of infinite money. And banks, this is even stranger still, banks with more money than they know what to do with, literally deposits coming out their ears and being close to saying, no more, please. And yet, what are they doing at the same time? They're issuing billions of dollars in future debt obligations. Isn't that curious? Well, you know, it's also curious. And you and I both get calls often where people say, are they manipulating this market or are they manipulating that market? The answer to that question is always yes. You can always manipulate in the short run uh, if you've got enough money, especially if it's free. And, uh, you know, look at the stock market this last week. What, was there manipulation in the stock market at that time? Self-interest is a predictable thing. And sometimes all you have to do is look at the numbers. You get expiration of options last week, uh, $540 billion worth of options. And, you know, of course, the new SEC chief, Gensler, we want, would love to see him uh, do some sleuthing. And, and that would be an appropriate place to start with over a half a trillion dollars in options moving towards expiration. It, it's no surprise to see some shenanigans played within the equities markets uh, coming into options expiration. So there's at least a couple of places, a couple of numbers to start on. One of the excuses for all this stimulus that's been flowing to the you know hands of the people has been because of employment problems. You know, the idea is, well, you know, COVID still exists. There's probably people who 
don't have jobs. But I think, again, let's just reverse that. If you're a business owner right now, you can't fill a job. Well, and that's one of those aberrant but perhaps predictable behaviors. If you've got 42% of businesses that can't fill job openings, could that be because it's more lucrative to collect benefits than it is to show up for work? I mean, it's strange when you have benefits coming in that far exceed what you would be making if you were full-time employed. Right. Uh, so it's no surprise also that we've got the not in the labor force numbers, well over $90 million at last glance. And my concern is that for government checks to look less attractive, wages, wages are going to have to rise. And granted, that's great for workers, but it's not so great for one of the key dimensions of inflation. Uh, wage pressures are coming. Dave, one of our favorite restaurants here in Durango, I remember talking to the managers and a couple of the servers. And uh, during the period of time where the stimulus checks were coming and the unemployment was coming, they actually could have made more by not being there. It literally was loyalty to their job that was getting them to actually go work. So when a government feels like they can print as much money, I mean, are we right now federal spending? Let me just ask you, are we making up federal spending right now with the tax revenues that are coming in? You know, we like to think about things in very basic terms. The way we manage a household would be one example if you make a dollar, you can spend a dollar. And maybe there's times when you might have to spend a dollar and 10 cents just because there's a surprise element in, in, in your expenses for that month. And you make up for it the next month. So surpluses and deficits, you try to balance out over time. And in the case of the U.S. government, it's quite different. Jim Bianco points out that only during World War II, during the Great Depression, during World War I, uh, the Civil War, and the War of 1812, did taxes cover less than 50% of federal spending? Oh, yeah. And, and also right now. So we are, you know, <laughs> we're bringing in a dollar in terms of tax revenue, and we're spending $2, or actually a little bit more than that. And so this is the second highest deficit spending, levels that we've seen of deficit spending. Uh, the only other highest point was World War II. That was wow. the only other higher point. So last March... 2020, our budget shortfall just for the month was $119 billion. This year, the March federal deficit came in at $660 billion, larger so than- So five times, five times. That's right. And that's larger than what we'd usually have in an entire year. So for the month of March, Washington borrowed 70 cents for every dollar spent. So again, you know, we talk about the marginal differences in how we would manage a household and what ultimately is 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 sustainable, what you can imagine as sustainable. And there's a different kind of imagination being used at the level of federal government. You know, but the way that you can catch a government spending too much is by watching the interest rates that they have to pay. You know, we've talked about artificial rates being held down low and you know that manipulation can occur. But that doesn't happen in a lot of the countries that don't have reserve currencies. I mean, the United States has a reserve currency. We, we do have that exorbitant privilege where we can do an awful lot of stuff that doesn't show what the market's doing. But, uh, you know, you look at the Greeks, you look at the Portuguese, their rates are rising. But, Kevin, this is a really important issue because you have the central banks, both the ECB and the Federal Reserve, expanding their balance sheet to record levels. And they are buying debt hand over fist to keep rates at an extraordinarily low level. And in spite of all their buying, we are seeing a shift in interest rates. Just watching the debt markets over the last 60 to 120 days, the drama has centered in sovereign paper. And of course, our rates have come off extraordinarily low levels, likewise the European rates. So yeah, I mean, looking at year to date figures, Greek yields are up 28 basis points. 28 basis points, they're still below 1%. Portuguese rates are up 37 basis points to a total of 40 basis points. I mean, so they basically come off of zero. So again, Portuguese debt was hugging the zero line. Spain, too, is up 35 basis points to a total of 39. And again, just basically at zero is where we were beginning of the year. And when you think of Spain at 39 basis points, uh, well, that's because clearly there's no risk. There's no risk over a 10-year period in Spain. That's what, that's what the market concludes with that kind of pricing. Germany is still negative, 23 basis points. And that's after rates have been rising about 34 basis points since the beginning of the year. French yields, 
another example of just amazing fiscal and political stability through time, they have stayed negative. They're still negative minus one basis point, And that's off the lows of, say, negative 34 basis points at the beginning of the year. Yeah. So just to refresh, the governments that are able to keep their rates low, it's because they're printing money and buying their own debt. And what you're saying is they're not even keeping up with that. Well, if a person sees through that, I mean, I, I don't know how you don't look at gold at this point again, especially after the double bounce that we had just this last month. Yeah, for sure. The dialogue around 1680, a double bottom, a technical confirmation on the upside, that's all important. And we covered that a number of weeks ago in our dialogue. Gold imports by India surged in March. Uh, so according to Bloomberg, these were the highest monthly totals in two years. It increased sevenfold from last year's numbers. So March 2020 was 13 tons in total. March 2021, 98.6 tons. Hmm. And here's an important reality in the gold market. Franco Nevada founder Pierre Lassonde has often pointed this out, that jewelry demand sets the floor in the gold price, while investor demand sets the ceiling. So judging by March's Indian buying, you could say that the floor is in. Because that's jewelry buying for the most part, correct? Absolutely. So seeing things differently, we know of curated news feeds and algorithm anticipated personal truths. This is some of what we were talking about with our friend Justin McBrayer when we talked about fake news. But what does it really look like to see things from a different vantage point? This might be an, an exercise in empathy. It might be an exercise in insanity. Uh, I'll let you be the judge. Yeah, I can't help but think back, Dave, uh, some of the morality changes that we've seen over the last several hundred years. You know, we've talked about revolutions. You know, the difference between the American Revolution and the French Revolution is profound. But then, of course, then we had, you know, the Victorian age, you know, in England, and we actually saw the abolition of slavery during that period of time. And then, of course, the wave comes back and goes the other direction, and we have the, the immoralists, you know, the Bloomsbury group. And so I, I just wonder, now that we live in a day and age where you can actually have manufactured for you and fed to you, exactly the kind of news and philosophy that you've shown the artificial intelligence on the internet that you, you prefer. Can you imagine w what this next morality shift will be? Will it be the philosopher? Will it be the, uh, the scientist? Well, I think what we're seeing is a, is a toying with words and, and meanings and definitions. And so, you know, what was bad at one point is now good. In the age mm. of new morality, uh, we set aside the constraints of the past. We reconsider the present. Uh, this is sort of in a, in a fresh and uninhibited light. And now we're free. And in our day and age, we are free because we have the infinite money tree. So it was not Gladstone and Wilberforce that freed the Victorian world of the old mores. Uh, in fact, they were the ones referencing uh, uh, an even older morality. Uh, it was Strachey and the Bloomsbury Group um, setting aside the out-of-date conventions, trading up, if you will, looking for something new and progressive, the unconstrained. Every generation has its avant-garde, and sometimes they show up on the cultural scene as artists other times as moralists, as you mentioned, perhaps immoralists. And this time it's actually as economists. Well, modern monetary theory economists, because I, I can't help but think back to Genesis 3, the, the garden, uh, when it's like, yeah, you can eat from this tree and you will not die. <laughs> Today's version of the new morality is in the debt markets. The bad debt of the past was associated with greed. And that's what we think of today. We will henceforth refer to it as greed debt. So relabel. Yeah. So for decades, it's benefited Wall Street, friends of Wall Street, banks, corporations in pursuit of privatized gains. And the Wall Street era of greed is good was fueled by what we now will classify as bad debt. Mm. Central banks push this kind of bad debt into every nook and cranny. Uh, some think that they're still doing that. Of course they are. We don't need to lose sleep over bad debt because the solution on offer for quote unquote bad debt is it'll be neutralized through taxes. So Dave, of course you're being uh, tongue in cheek, but we're talking about the relabeling of debt, calling it something different so that we can justify it. So in a way, the greed is good era, uh, you know, Gordon Gecko comes to mind. Remember the movie Wall Street? And yeah, greed is good. That 
they put that picture in the mind of the person who thinks, well, what's the difference between that now and creating debt with modern monetary theory? But actually, modern monetary theory is really just, it's Santa Claus, benevolent Santa Claus with a gigantic checkbook. Yeah, so please keep that in mind. Um, th this is not exactly my belief. But it was once believed that mythologies of earlier and clearly less developed cultures uh, would create something to serve them. And in the end, they would end up serving it. You had Aladdin's lamp. You had social media. You had uh, greed debt. All of them offered something enticing, but delivered in the end a form of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the case with debt for the common good. So again, this is the new debt, the good debt. We pay as we go. We print as we need to because we can. This time is different. Debt serves us. We'll never serve it. As we harness the transformational power of tomorrow <laughs> for every need that we have today, tomorrow has its own generative power, creative energy. All you do is press a button, print more checks. And someday, we won't even have to wait for the U.S. Postal Service to delay our gratification. Can you imagine, Kevin, having a direct digital link to Uncle Joe and the infinite money tree? Well, and I wouldn't mind the infinite money tree because it also, I think, comes with uh, universal income. But, uh, you know, I, I can't help but think in a way they're saying we're going to do this for the children. That's you know, right. How many, how many horrid things have occurred all through history because we're going to do it for the children? In the age of the new morality, we see debt in a new light. That's what we have to come to terms with. Consider this the next great awakening. Um, debt for the common good is good. It's good for everyone when governments spend for the common good. Any debt that accrues for the benefit of the collective must be seen through that lens. Now, I mean, there are qualitative differences. Consider the new approach to infrastructure. It's not limited by roads and bridges as, as we might previously have understood those concepts. Uh, but instead, We've dedicated ourselves to new human infrastructure. This is the conversation. This is what we hear, right? Investing in social equality entails building inroads to social justice, bridges of love to promote unity. I think that's kind of how they're casting the reparations mm. conversation. Mm. But, but let's not forget child care. Let's not forget elder care. I think we should even be more imaginative. I've been imagining for some time a government-funded doggy daycare. Uh, to make sure that families <laughs> with pets are on an equal footing with families with kids. Well, why not? And I'm even wondering why four-legged family members aren't in public school for their unique developmental needs. This is the age of modern monetary practice, not theory. So we should be bold. Not only modern monetary practice, but since it is for social justice and, and these wonderful things like doggy daycare, I, I like your idea. Uh, that's a form of paying it forward, isn't it? Instead of Taking, you know, we've talked about debt actually just spending tomorrow's money, but are we not turning it around and paying it forward? <laughs> That's right. It's kind of a paying it forward. Uh, we can pay for all the change we ever wanted, and the cost is fanciful. That's what we learn about MMP, not, not T, MMP, modern monetary practice. In retrospect, we should not have lingered so long as dependence on monetary policy. The meager trillions that central banks produce for us, those resources, it's amazing that we've stayed uh, slaves, if you will, with strings attached to interest and principal repayment. Those are the narrow channels of liquidity, which only flow towards hedge funds and pension funds and trust funds. And so today, the benefit is we get to thank our lucky stars. There's new liquidity. And, and it's not the monetary flows, it's the fiscal flows. The fiscal flows from the politically enlightened, they are flooding the land like so much egalitarian light, rays of light reaching every burdened soul, every burdened soul that needs a little extra money. 1400 bucks, in fact, from Uncle Joe. It's amazing. Someday, I think it will be more universal, more basic, and more of a predictable income. You know, it's amazing. Again, I can't help but look back at Genesis 3 because you had a tree that we were told not to eat from because it would just kill us. That sounds to me a little bit like this unlimited tree. But the other thing, too, is man was told that he would have to work by the sweat of his brow. UBI says you don't. And I think you misunderstand something, Kevin. In the history of money and credit, there have been doubters, those that lack the faith and, and eschew the new morality of the infinite money tree. And, and, and those doubters 
are rooted, like so many Aristotelians, in, in ontology, in ontological categories, constantly asking questions about substance and quantity and quality and relationships. What is something? How big is something? In this case, 600 and what, what did I say earlier? $660 billion in debt in one month. Well, does it have distinguishing features? Does it relate to other things of substance? Yeah, but you're, you're so old-fashioned, Dave. Why in the world would you want a real thing? That's what I'm saying. The problem with these old school categories is that it trains your thinking towards real things, actual bridges and roads. And that's tragically short sighted. The power of our new creations includes debt for the common good. It's that we are now unshackled by the mundane. We are free to invest our imaginations in all the possibilities and prospects we desire. Well, and we have added this new element. You know, for quite a while, the central bankers were saying, okay, well, we're going to print all this money, but one of these days, the government's going to have to come in and start spending it. Okay, fiscal, remember, fiscal response. It sounds to me like the politicians now are just laughing at the central bankers because why would they even need them? That's right. Governments have regained the lead role, now have control of their limitless futures, and ours too. And they've put the central bank's narrow and, and frankly less popular, quote unquote, interests in a, in a proper and proportional support function. So yes, if we need central bank money printing, we can always go back to that. Uh, but we have something that we can create infinitely ourselves. And, and that is credit. That is debt. Uh, the commanding heights of the global economy have returned. They are once again in the hands of the protectors. And I'm, who are we talking about? Of course, our democratically elected leaders, who, miracle of miracles, can even raise the debt on occasion. Uh, we've seen that recently. Um, but from that point forward, we'll care for our every need from cradle to grave. Well, and you know, you had talked before about how right now businesses are having a hard time finding people to work for them, uh, yet people are still getting stimulus checks. So why go get a job? And, you know, frankly, for those who have young kids, why teach your kids to save? I mean, saving is a form of austerity, isn't it? And that's a that's a dirty word these days. Oh, well, austerity has always been a form of human cruelty. We, we recognize that now in the MMP world, mon monetary practice, global governments can achieve so much more these days without the arbitrary limitations set on resources. We know this now. Austerity has always been a form of human cruelty. It's as if we've endured a, a poverty mindset, like existing in a forest full of fruit trees. And yet with all this produce hanging about around us, we leave it on the tree to rot. Oh, you know, I listen to you, Dave, and I hate to say it, but I can hear just the S sound of the serpent saying, <laughs> take from the tree and eat. Surely there is no cost. <laughs> there is no cost. And our tree is an infinite provider. The, the fruit will always be in reach. All our protectors have to do is harvest and eat and, and share with us. If we're good and not evil by the new definitions, uh, never again will politicians be limited by resources. And this is a key transition, Kevin. I mean, I, I say in jest, but this really is a key transition, the move from monetary policy stimulus to fiscal stimulus, because any number of promises can be made and all promises will be kept because we have access to the infinite. This is the theory of the infinite money tree. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. Make sure you tune in on Thursday, the 22nd at 2 o'clock Mountain Time for the tactical short call with Doug Noland and David McIlvaney. Go to mwealthm.com to register. And you can call us here at ICA at 800-525-9556 or find us on the internet at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.